Hey family, I'm Pastor Torre. Pastor Sarah. We just want to greet you before you get ready to watch this powerful message. We believe it's going to change your life. We've been praying for you. And we also want you to partner with us in changing the lives of others. As you know, we invested a lot into technology so that we can continue to bring the word to you in innovative and creative ways. But we don't just stop there. We also believe in blessing people in a more pragmatic way. That's right. You're about to watch this video that is going to tremendously bless you. But what you don't get to see is how we're blessing people off of the pulpit. There are families that are being fed. There are women who are being saved from human trafficking. There are so many organizations that we are able to support thanks to your generosity. So we want to invite you to be a part of changing the world with us. Yeah, we've been very intentional in this season to, to partner with organizations and support them financially that are making a difference considering a crisis. So we just thank you. They're giving instructions on the screen here. Partner with us and let's get into this word. Tonight, we're just going to dive right into it. Uh, we, we have a lot of word to cover. We're going to look at the book of Genesis. We're going to start at chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. And while you're pull, pulling that up, let me just set the stage of where we are in the text. So at this point, God has already created the heavens and the earth. He's put everything on the field. He's provided fruits and berries and everything that man could ever want to indulge in, right? He created Adam, put him in this garden, the Garden of Eden. And that word Eden, when you translate that into the Hebrew, it actually means pleasure, so he puts Adam in a place of pleasure, right? Second thing he does is he, he gives Adam the freedom to do anything, to eat anything in this garden. And he says, except for eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he told Adam that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. You will surely die. And then so, you know, God found Adam in this place, and he, he thought it would be necessary to give him a helper that was comparable to him, a helper that was on his level, a he helper that he could strategize and do life with. And so after creating all of the beasts of the field, he saw that there was not one comparable to Adam, so he created Eve. And we all know he caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, pulled a rib out of his body, sealed the wound, created Eve out of that rib, presented her to Adam, Adam got excited, said, this is bone of my bone. They were naked. They were unashamed. They became one flesh, and they were living in paradise. So this is where we are in the text. And so when we pick up in chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat? Of every tree of the garden and the woman said to the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said you shall not eat nor shall you touch he ain't say that Eve lest you die then the serpent said to the woman you will surely not die for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave <laughs> to her husband with her. Don't do it, Adam. We're all thinking this. We know how the story goes, but we all just say, don't do it. And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Remember that. Among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called out to Adam and said, where are you? So he said, Adam, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, 
the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me <laughs> of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? Then the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it provides healing. I thank you that it provides direction. I thank you that it provides wisdom and strategy. So Father, right now I ask that you just move through me. Lord God, I am your instrument. None of me, all of you, allow your will to be done right now on earth as it is in heaven. Allow people to be changed. Allow people to be transformed. Allow people to be healed. Allow people to be motivated to do the things that you've called them to do. Heavenly Father, I prophesy right now that people are not going to leave the same right now. Lord God, I declare it in the mighty name of Jesus. You are doing something new. As evidenced by this broadcast, you are doing something new in the earth, Lord God. So we thank you for what you have already done. And we declare that we will follow your lead as we go through the process of this you are doing in the earth. So have your way right now. We thank you in advance. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So family, this text is a very controversial text. And similar to Adam and Eve, this is a text that causes people to point fingers. Who's to blame for the fall, right? Is it Adam's fault? Is it Eve's fault? If you ask men, you know, most men will say it's her fault. Why did she give me the, the fruit in the first place? We already had everything we needed. We're here in paradise. We're naked. We're unashamed. We're eating all of this deliciousness. Why do you have to go and get the fruit that God said we couldn't have? Some women might say, well, the man should have covered her. It's not her fault. God didn't give her the instruction. He should have covered her. And if we look at the word, we know that Adam and Eve were one flesh, right? So we can just settle that now. It's nobody's fault individually. But what I want us to do, because I believe the Bible gives us the ability to look into situations and learn from the mistakes of those in the Bible and we can also learn from the triumphs of those in the Bible, and we can leverage that information to help us navigate in the world right now. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at what could Adam and Eve have done differently in the garden? First thing I see is when the serpent approached Eve and started questioning what the word was, they were right there in the garden. They could have just reached out to God who was there and said, hey, God, hold on, serpent. Hey, father, come here real quick. Um, it's a little snake man, a little serpent is trying to say that the reason you don't want us to do this is because we're going to be wise. And, and he's making it sound real good. Oh, OK. Rebuke him. All right. Get out of here. Story's over. The end. Right. They could have checked in with God immediately because they were right there in the presence and he was not far away. They could have checked in with him. The second thing they could have done is Adam could have been more thorough in his conversation with Eve when reiterating God's instruction. I say reiterating because we look at the text and if we look at verse 3, we see Eve seems to be a little confused. She's saying things like, the Lord said, don't touch it. And we know that God didn't say, don't touch it. So I believe Adam did. I believe Adam told Eve not to touch the tree because I too am a husband. And I have also tried the don't touch approach. Just don't touch it. Do not touch it. Because if you don't touch it, then it's impossible for us to fall. If you don't touch it, we don't even have a shot at eating it. If you can't touch it, how can you eat it, right? Seems, seems to be common sense. But we know that the don't touch strategy don't, doesn't work. I'll tell you as a husband, when my wife, because I too am married, and I'm also married to a woman that can be influenced not like that, not by like demonic stuff and trickery, but 
the influence happens to present itself in the form of shopping apps, okay? Amazon Prime, Shopify, OfferUp, like anything that you can spend money through a push of a button on an app, that's how the enemy seems to try to attack our family, all right? I'm going to rebuke him right now. I'll be rebuking him every week. But I used to try to implement the don't touch strategy and say, hey, babe, don't even touch the app. If you don't touch it, it is not possible for the enemy to access our pockets in such a way that causes us to say, man, where did our money go? If you don't even touch it, it doesn't have the ability to impact us in that way. I've even taken the liberty of deleting some of the apps <laughs> out of her phone. Um, yeah. As if she can't just look at the phone and see that it's been deleted. And she's even said, hey, babe, you, you don't think I can just reload the app? Like, come on, seriously? But I go so far in my don't touch strategy that I, I'm willing to remove the apps myself. Another thing is, is when it comes to, to Target. I have an issue with shopping at Target and mainly because the name of the store is Target, but every time I go there, I seem to miss the mark. I don't get it. I'm never on target with what I intended to buy. I'm never on target with maintaining in, in budget. I'm always missing the mark. I'm missing. I'm buying everything except what the target was. And I believe it might even be written that he that walks into Target to buy diapers shall come out not only with diapers, but with two avocados, an air conditioner, a water filter, a ceiling fan, and a desk lamp. I came here to get diapers. So I, I tell my wife, don't send me to Target because if I don't go to Target, then the enemy won't have access to my eyes to convince me that I need all these things that I didn't even come in here to get. Don't even touch a list if you're going to send me to Target to get it. Now, am I saying Target is the devil? No. A little devil-ish? Eh. You be the judge. I miss the mark. That's the definition of sin. Every time I go to Target, I miss the mark. I digress. But the don't touch strategy does not work. I've tried it with my children. And you try telling a three-year-old or a one-year-old not to touch something. They will look you right in your eyes as they're touching that thing. So the point I'm making is the don't touch strategy doesn't work. There has to be something that speaks to the why behind the don't touch. So the strategy behind me not wanting my wife to use the apps is because, hey, babe, we're trying to save up for another car. You're pregnant. We're about to welcome our third child into the world. Praise God. I need a car that can fit three car seats. We need a car that can fit three car seats. Everyone knows that I'm not called to drive a minivan. That's a very specific calling, and I'm not called to do that. So we have to save everything that we can to go towards this SUV that we will need. Now, when my wife goes to, to purchase something on an app or send me to Target, she knows, wait a minute, this does not line up with our strategy to go towards the purchase of the car that we are called to have. And if I'm not operating within the confines of the strategy, then I'm going to be dictating the promise that we're called to. The church has also tried the don't touch strategy. <laughs> Uh-oh. I guess we're going there. The church has tried it. And what that looks like is, I don't know about you, but growing up in the church, we hear a lot of, Oh, don't even touch that. Sex? No, that's the devil. Don't touch that. Why are you even going outside after 11 o'clock p.m.? There's nothing open at 11 o'clock except 7-Eleven and legs. <laughs> Why are you even going out? Don't even touch it. Drinking? No, we don't know alcohol. That's the devil. Smoking? You trying to smoke the devil's grass? No, don't do that. That's the devil. Everything is the devil. The devil, 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 devil. So... The problem with that is you tell a generation of people, don't touch it, 
without giving them the reasoning or the strategy behind your why, and it ends up with a generation of people that don't like church. Oh, man, this ain't what I was trying to talk about, Brunus. You end up with a generation of people that once they come from under your care, because when they're under your care, you can control them to a certain degree. You can give your children curfews. You can take the car keys away, make sure they don't leave the house. But guess what? There's going to be a point in time where they go off to college or they enter the real world. And now they're experiencing life. And all of a sudden, the things that you told them not to touch because it's the devil are now being presented to them. And as they're being presented, it's not being presented as a devil. Mm. This is not what I was writing down to say. When these people are presented with the things that tempt them, it's not, hey, I'm the devil. You want to get naked? Hey, I'm the devil. Hey, you want to you wanna go out and, and get some headaches and lose our jobs and, and, and regret everything that we did? No, it's, hey, let's go hang out. Let's go, let's, it's, it's, listen, it's a good time. Like, it's just a little bit of drinky drink, just a little bit of smoky smoke, right? Let's just go and do it. YOLO, you only live once. And, and now it's being presented to us in a very enticing way. So because there is no strategy behind the don't touch approach, now the thing being offered is a lot more attractive than the reason to not touch it. There has to be a strategy behind the don't touch approach. So Adam and Eve could have simply just sat down and said, hey, okay, what is the reason behind us not eating this fruit? It's because we will surely die. We're, we have a pretty good setup right now, and we can take God at his word that if he says we're going to die, then that's probably going to happen. So why don't we set up some parameters, put some things in place that's going to protect our environment, that's going to seal off entry points for, for the, from the enemy and allow us to continue to thrive and live in this place of pleasure that God has put us in. What are you doing to protect the environment that God has called you to? What is the strategy behind that? The biggest mistake, in my opinion, was entertaining the serpent in the first place. When he came up and started, you know, engaging in conversation, that's the trick that he used. He wants to engage in conversation and get you going back and forth with him so that you forget the presence of God is even so close to you. And once you're engaged and he lures you in, he's able to provide an alternative to what God told you. And then you find yourself falling. They should have known that the enemy, that the serpent was not there to aid them in any way. Because the word says in, in Genesis 2 and 20 that they weren't like God had, he, he had yet to create a helper comparable to Adam. That's what he created Eve for. So knowing that the serpent was there before Eve should tell us that he was never there to help Adam. So when they saw him, they should have already known, like, yeah, something's fishy. You're not here to provide any value. You're here for some trickery. And I think if they would have understood that, they would have been able to weigh the pros and cons of, of going with his way of doing things and would have determined that it was not worth it. Say amen on your couch. Type amen if you understand that in, in the comments. Just type amen. I'm getting used to this thing. Type amen. Amen? Amen. So the truth of the matter is, even though we know this now, we can't change what happened. We can't change the fall. It is what it is. But we can leverage what we've learned now to help us maneuver in this time to deal with our current enemy. Amen? Because we have a current enemy. So I'm going to walk through a couple of examples of, of how we can deal with our current enemy. Point number one, know that the enemy is already defeated in every way. Know that the enemy is already defeated. He might come and attack you in your mind and you're dealing with depression. Know that the enemy is defeated. He might come and tell you that you're not worth it and that your life is over and you're battling suicidal thoughts. Know that the enemy is defeated. 
He might come and, and tell you that you're lonely. You need to start spending more time in this, in this porn app to please yourself. Know that the enemy is already defeated. We need to know that the enemy is defeated so that we don't allow him to influence us and that we can focus on the promise that God has already established for us. Know that he is defeated. The devil has no victory except for the one you give him credit for. Stop giving the enemy participation trophies that he didn't earn. He is already defeated. The devil cannot make you do anything. Eve blamed the devil. He can't make you do anything. The only way he can make you do something is if you reduce yourself down to a level where he has dominion over you. But if we remember, we were created to have dominion over him. So if the devil made you do something, it means you've reduced yourself so low that he has the authority to make anything your reality. He doesn't have that kind of power. Know that he's defeated. Know that the enemy is nothing to be afraid of. And if we see ourselves right, if we see ourselves as, as children of God created in his image and likeness, we already know we have dominion over the enemy, then we realize he's nothing to be afraid of. The big old scary devil with the, ah, uh, it's, no, it's a lie. He's defeated. He's nothing. He's pointless. He's worthless. Don't make him bigger than he is. And when we don't see him right, it allows us to be fearful. And I'll admit, even as a grown man, when I first started walking with God and, and I married my wife, Christina, who is a very spiritual person, she would get attacked in her sleep. And I was a believer. I knew God. I loved God. was walking with God. But I had never experienced like, attacks like this. And I remember one night she's tossing and turning, and I'm like, what is going on? Like, are you okay? And, and she's sleeping. And all of a sudden she says, in the name of Jesus. And I'm like, are you all right? What is going on? She was like, the, the enemy was trying to attack me in my sleep. And so I'm like, oh, man, I'm kind of shook if I'm honest. Like, I've never seen something where the enemy is that bold to come and attack you in your sleep. But if you think about it, it's nothing about boldness. The enemy is a coward. Who attacks someone in their sleep? That's just goes to show how much of a coward he is. So anything that's going to have to sneak up on you like he snuck up on Eve, any enemy that's going to have to wait until you're asleep to try to attack you is a coward, is a loser. That's a loser characteristic. Just go ahead and type in the comments, devil, you are a loser. <laughs> and then LOL, laugh at him. We laugh at the devil around here. Man, this is good. I am preaching to me, Brunus. Man, whoo! All right, let's keep going. Um, we also have to remember that even in our mistakes, even when we miss the mark, even when we, when we backslide, because it will happen, we were already created to have eternal victory over the enemy. How is that? I'll tell you how. Let's go back to Genesis 2 and 7. This is before the fall. I'm going to prove it to you that we were already set up to have eternal victory over the enemy. 2 and 7 reads, Genesis 2 and 7 reads, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Of the dust of the ground. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. That's before the fall. Let's look at Genesis 3 and 14. This is after the fall. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. So if we look at that, we understand that God took the dust and created us, breathed life into our body, gave us dominion, and then turned around and used that same dust to curse your enemy. So the very essence of you is a threat to the enemy. Your mere existence, even on your worst day, is a threat to the enemy. The same dust that God used to give you dominion is the same dust the enemy is choking on. Man, tell the enemy to choke on it. Choke on it. Choke on it. Choke on it. I feel the power of God in this place, and there's nobody even in here. That's how I know it's God. That's how I know it's God. <laughs> Choke on it. Oh, man. Oh, cotton mouth devil. Listen. Listen. 
Tell the enemy to eat my dust. Eat my dust. Eat my dust. Choke on it. I love picking on the enemy. He's taunted us long enough. We've given him too much credit long enough. We need to take our rightful positions as men and women, sons of, and daughters of the Most High God, understanding that we are sons of the Most High King. That, that means we are royal, and that means that we have crowns, and that means that we should walk like a king walks. We should walk like a queen walks, and we should speak like it and act like it. It's a different swagger that comes with it. Come on. Mm. So you see, the, the, the very thing that God used to bless us, he used to curse the devil. The Bible refers to the enemy as the prince of the power of the air. And the Greek word for that word, air, can be translated to the lower air that we breathe. The lower air that we breathe. So, yes, he has authority, but he has authority over the dusty domain, the dusty domain, the low area. That's why we got to stay high, right? If Eve would have never entertained the conversation, they would still, we would still be in paradise right now. But she got to his level of engaged in conversation, and she stooped down to the dusty domain. We got to stay out of the dusty domain. I'm getting ahead of myself, but we got to just make sure we stay above that domain of that lower, that lower air. That brings me to my, my second point. As it relates to navigating life, dealing with our current day enemy, stay out of the dust. Stay out of the dust. That's the title of tonight's message, by the way. Out of the dust. Out of the dust. Now, the dust, for definition, for context of this message, is anything that does not measure up to what God has called you to be, to what God has called you to do, and what God has called you to have. The dust represents anything that does not measure up to what, what God called you to be, do, or have. And so we just have to stay out of the enemy's domain because the enemy is only effective in the areas in which we give him access. He's only effective in the areas in which we're, we're giving him access. And that's evident by his encounter with Eve. We cannot be tempted if we don't give access. Get this. You're only tempted by what you tolerate. You're only tempted by what you tolerate. Man, that's for somebody. You've been tolerating a lot of stuff that's been beneath you. I feel that for somebody. You've been tolerating people treating you a certain way that is beneath you. You've been tolerating people dealing with you in a way that does not mirror the love and the character of Jesus Christ. And you've allowed yourself to stoop low into the dust. And when you stoop into the dust, you meet dusty people. <laughs> when you live in the dust, you end up in dusty relationships, dusty situationships, dusty partnerships, dusty business ventures, just dust. Stay out of the dust. Inspect your access points. When it comes to the dust, we got to start going back and dusting off some access points. Who has access to you right now? How did you end up in the place of defeat that you claim to be in? What was the entry point? We got to check the access points. The present day enemy works through people. He works through people. And dusty people don't always show up dusty. Like sometimes you got to look real close to see the dust. You got to look real close to see the dust. And we should have a zero tolerance for dusty people. <laughs> Listen, I love you, but you're dusty. Can't rock with you. We don't have to tell them that, but we can just know and plan our exit strategy. Amen? Ain't got time for dusty people. Ain't got time for no dusty people. And the impact that the dust has. Look at the impact the serpent had on, on Adam and Eve. 
They went from being powerful, naked, let's just say they're on their honeymoon, eating delicious fruits and vegetables, naked in a garden. That sounds like an amazing honeymoon, right? All of a sudden, they end up afraid, naked, with no covering, and hiding from God's presence. That's a big one right there, hiding from God's presence. I spoke earlier about the fact that the church has, has made a mistake when it comes to the don't touch strategy. And I think what happens is we, the fact that we're not having church as usual now, this is a time where we can actually really grow and be authentic and have real relationships with God, right? And in order to do that, we have to get rid of the shame of anything that we've been through because shame hinders our ability to heal the next generation. Shame hinders our ability to enable them to thrive and to overcome the obstacles that they will soon be faced with. And, and, and how I know that's true? Because the word says that they overcame by the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, and the word of their testimony, speaking about the goodnesses and, and the greatness of God and what he has brought them through. So if we're shamed of something, hallelujah, if we're shamed of something that we've been through, that causes us to not seek the presence of God. If we don't seek the presence of God, we're not able to be healed from that thing that we just suffered through. And if we don't receive the healing, we cannot receive the transformation. And if we don't receive the transformation, the people that we're called to serve don't see it. And if we don't receive the transformation, we cannot speak on how God once took me from this situation, brought me out of it, and allowed me to thrive above it. And so now we're talking to a generation telling them to not to touch it. But if we would just open up and be vulnerable and say, yes, I made that mistake. This is what you can look forward to if you do go that route. I'm not going to tell you not to touch it. I'm going to give you a strategy and a reason as to why it is not good for you. I'm going to show you what God has for you and show you the promises of that and show you how that impacted me and how God brought me through something that I struggled with. We got to be more vulnerable and more transparent as leaders, as ministers, as parents, as mentors. This is for anybody that has a responsibility over another life. Transparency is the ability for you to open up to God and be healed from that thing that you've been troubled by. It's the ability for God to come in and transform you. It's the ability for you to pour into another generation, allow them to, to miss out and not make the same mistakes that you made so that they can thrive and overcome because they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the word of their testimony. Hallelujah. Inspect your access points. So I challenge all of you, as you're inspecting your access points, look closely. Look very closely. Right now is a time where it's tricky because we're sheltering in place, a lot of us, and, and all of a sudden, everybody's offering free advice. Everybody's offering free game. Hey, free subscriptions right now. So what are your access points? If you're struggling with lust, does it have anything to do with the fact that you accepted that free upgrade from the porn app? And now in your idle time, you're wasting not only time, but seed. Man, I need to get off of this. I got to get off of this. Is it the fact that... <laughs> I got to get through this. God, come on. The fact that you have this idle time and you have a Bible that's been collecting dust, mm, it's been collecting dust. You have allowed the dust to settle, but yet when you look at your lifestyle, you have settled along with it. You are not called to settle. When the dust settles, you are not called to settle. You are called to rise above it and to live the life that God calls you to live. I got to keep going. We will be in here until Friday. Whew. The last thing I'll say about that is all you have to do is walk in alignment. Walking in alignment, walking in the promises of God, walking in the character of Christ just living life how he intended you to live it, when the dust shows up, it will identify itself. 
if you listen hard enough, if somebody is telling me something that is beneath who I am, it is beneath my call. That person's not beneath me, but their dust is. I ain't got time for the dust, baby. No dust bunnies in here. Get out your little dust things. All right? Type dust free zone in the comments. This is a dust free zone, baby. I brush that off. Point number three, as it relates to navigating life, dealing with your enemy, thriving in a life God called you to live. Point number three is clear the air. You have to clear the air. Clear the air. Some of you have allowed the dust to settle and you've realized that you have settled. But guess what? You do not have to stay in that place. You can clear the air. What does clearing the air look like? Clearing the air looks like worship. Welcoming the presence of God into every area of your life. It's like welcoming the cleaning lady to go in and clean the cracks and stuff that you haven't even looked at. Opening yourself up to God will reveal the dust. And when he reveals it to you, when he says, oh, yeah, that dude that you've been dealing with, he dusty. <laughs> that young lady that, you know, you've been dealing with, yeah, she's dusty, too. Um, the fact that this person is always offering you things that don't benefit you is evidence of their dust. The fact that somebody's trying to get you to compromise who you are to serve them is a sign of their dust. Clear the air. An atmosphere of worship is an atmosphere absent of the dust. An atmosphere of the presence of God is an atmosphere that is absent of the dust. Hallelujah. Now, regardless of, of how dusty you might be, and I too have been a dusty one, there is always a fresh start. There is always a fresh start. And now that we're in this shelter in place season, now that we're in a place where we're having global church via the internet, which is actually one of the blessings of COVID, because quite honestly, some of you have been using the physical church facility as a crutch. Oh, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. All right. You've been using the physical building as a crutch because the appearance of holiness was good enough for you. My God. The appearance of righteousness was good enough for you. So you were okay living however you wanted to live Monday through Saturday. As long as you could come to church and be seen praying for somebody, that was good enough for you. Guess what? Now the facility is gone. Now you're forced into relationship with God on your own. You're forced to experience him in a new way. You are forced to pray for yourself because the online ministry is not always going to be available. You are forced into relationship. The crutch is gone, baby. The crutch is gone. Now we got to get that dust up out of there. Ah, okay. Mm. We got to understand that true relationship, family, true relationship with God, true relationship and intimacy with the Holy Spirit and being proactive about it is the way that we keep our atmosphere free of the dust. If that is you, if you've realized that you've been living in a place, you've allowed the dust to settle so long, and, and now, honestly, you can't fathom a life beyond the dust because this has been your norm. This is for somebody. Abusive relationship is all I know. It's, it's a sign of love because I saw my mom being abused, and so me being abused is just a sign that, that he loves me. No, the devil is a liar, and the devil is defeated. He's defeated. That is a lie. You've been in the dust so long that it has now become your normal. So we need to rise up out of the dust. I need you to look towards your heavenly father and say, Father, I am coming out of the dust. Type that in the comments right now. I am coming out of the dust. I am coming out of the dust. I am coming out of the dust because it is no longer time for us to just settle where the dust is. We were created from the dust Watch this, to ultimately have dominion over it. 
You weren't created to be dusty. Brush that off. You were not created to be dusty. You created to have dominion. So right now, this is an opportunity for you to come out of the dust, for you to look at your life and to open yourself up to God in such a way that you say, I'm sick of it. I'm coming out of the dust, but I really don't know how. I really don't know how. This relationship I've been in for 10 years, this situation I've been struggling with has been something I've struggled with my whole life. I don't know how to, to adopt a new mindset where I don't live in a place of lack and, and I can receive everything that God has for me. I've never seen life that way. I've never experienced the goodness. I've never experienced generosity. I've never experienced overflow. God says, see, I do a new thing. And we have to understand that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So this is an opportunity for you to connect with the source of the gift. And the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. You don't have to be shady. You don't have to be dusty to be successful. The gift of God is available. That is eternal life. That is life more abundantly. That is life where I don't know how I went from poverty to the penthouse, but all glory be to God. That is a promise that is not just for people preaching and leading. That is a promise for everybody that believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and decide to walk with him. There are tangible benefits to walking with Jesus Christ, and that is available to you right now. So if you receive the new life that is available through Jesus Christ, just put I receive right now in the comments. I receive, 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 I receive. Hallelujah. The old is passed away. There's always a fresh start in Jesus Christ. There's always a new beginning in Jesus Christ. Do not allow shame to prevent you from walking in everything that God has promised for you. I tell you right now, you will look up and have wasted years of your life not knowing that that was an option and it was a dusty option that you signed up for because you shrunk to the dusty realm. You're not dusty. You're a king. You're a queen. You're an heir of the kingdom. You're royal. Act like it. You've already won, so let's win. Thank you, thank God. Family, we love you. We thank God for you, and our team is here to help in any way that we can to help navigate this life with you. So continue to tune in, continue to pray with us. There are prayer ministers in, in, on the line right now, ready to pray with you. You can request prayer directly, and we'll, we'll hold your hand through this, and we'll get to know God together in a brand new way. So let's win. God bless you.